Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing to teach on a subject that I've entitled, Living in the Balance of Grace and Faith. This is one of my favorite things to teach. This is one of the things that when the Lord gave me this revelation and combined grace and faith together, it made a huge difference in my life. And so this is like a foundational thing that I teach. I've actually had a lot of people say that this is really the uniqueness about this ministry is that I don't just preach on grace or I don't just preach on faith, but I preach on the combination of the two. And it seems like very few people find that balance between grace and faith. They are either emphasizing that it's all up to God, it's just the grace of God, or they're emphasizing what we have to do, but very seldom do they combine the two. So yesterday, I started this series and gave quite an uh, introduction to it and summarized the whole teaching, but of course, I'm going to go into a lot more detail. I've got this book that's over a 200-page book, and I'm giving this to you. And we've also got a study guide that goes along with it, and it's the same material. It's just reformatted so that you can teach this to other people. And it's really a great way of doing it. And so we've got the study guide, we've got CDs, DVDs, and a USB. But I'm giving this book to you, and I am asking for people to give something because we will have tens of thousands. I think the last series that I gave away, we gave away over 60,000 books. And uh, anyway, I couldn't do that if nobody gave. So uh, we ask you to give something if you can, but if you uh, can't or wouldn't, I want you to have this teaching because it's changed my life and I believe it would change your life. So I was using yesterday the verses out of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, where it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It doesn't say that you're saved by grace alone. It doesn't say that you're saved by faith alone. Now, it's true that grace does save us. It's true that faith saves us. Matter of fact, I used yesterday, if you back up into Ephesians 2, 5, there's a parenthetical phrase at the end of that verse, and it says, by grace ye are saved. And that's the same person, Paul, that just three verses later says you're saved by grace through faith. So I wouldn't sit here and argue or criticize a person who says that you're saved by grace. I'm not going to criticize a person that says you're saved by faith because Paul made that same point in Romans, book of Romans, many different times, Romans chapter 3 and other places. But technically, you aren't saved by grace alone or you aren't saved by faith alone. You're saved by grace through faith. And I said these things briefly yesterday. I'm going to start amplifying on it and trying to drive this point home so that people get it. But grace is what God does for us. Faith is our positive response. Now, you can have a negative response. That would be unbelief, rejection, all those kind of things. But faith is a positive response to what God has already done through grace. If you start emphasizing what you must do, and if you emphasize it in a way that it's not you responding to God, but it's you doing something, and then you believe that God is going to respond to you. If you will pray, if you will study the Word, if you will do this, confess the Word, and do all these things, then you can move God. That is not biblical faith. That's what the Bible calls works in Romans chapter 3. And the whole book of Hebrews is against that whole concept. And the book of Galatians and Ephesians are all against that. Faith isn't something you do to make God move. Something it, Faith is something you do in response to God. So grace is God's part. Faith is our part. Grace is something that God in, did independent of us. Uh, it has nothing to do with us. If you tie your actions to God's grace and say, well, God only extends grace to people who are living for Him and loving Him and doing things right, well, then it's not grace anymore. You know, the simplest definition, it, it is a simple definition. It's not complete by any means, but a simple definition of grace is unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor. And if you start having to merit it, if you have to earn it, if you have to do something to deserve grace, then it's not grace. Grace is unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor. And as I quoted yesterday out of John chapter 1, it says, We beheld His glory, 
full of grace and truth. And then it says that grace and truth came by Jesus. Jesus came 2,000 years ago before you and I were ever born. We hadn't existed. We hadn't done anything good or bad, and yet God commended grace towards us 2,000 years ago. Jesus died for my sins and your sins 2,000 years ago. When you came to the Lord, and if, if you got born again, if you have made Jesus your Lord and received your salvation, it's not when you confess that, Jesus, I make you my Lord, that He died for your sins. He died for your sins 2,000 years ago. It's a done deal. You don't have anything to do with what Jesus has paid for. Jesus came 2,000 years ago before you and I existed, before our sins existed. He made all of the payment. Jesus did everything, and the Scripture says He is now seated at the Father's right hand. He is not dying for people. He is not applying His blood to us today. That was already done 2,000 years ago. What happens when a person gets saved? You don't say, oh, God, save me, and then the Lord responds to you and dies for your sins. He's already made the payment. He's already sprinkled His blood on the mercy seat. He's already dealt with the sins of the entire world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, He's the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He's already paid for the sins of the whole world. Now, if that's all you did was talk about grace, what God did through Jesus 2,000 years ago, then some people, see, can take that and say, well, the sins of the whole world are forgiven, and so therefore nobody's going to hell. God is just merciful to people, and it doesn't matter uh, what you've done. Somehow or another, God is just going to forgive everybody. Now, see, that's an abuse because that doesn't take into account that you aren't saved by grace alone. You're saved by grace through faith. If you don't respond to what God did for you, independent of you, unearned, undeserved, and unmerited, well, then you will have to answer for your own sins, and specifically the sin of rejecting Jesus and rejecting such a great payment. There is something that you have to do. So see, if all you do is just take that grace, it can lead you into these wrong type of things. And we see a lot of people that take grace, and because it's not balanced with faith, it leads them into these errors. But then on the other hand, you can sit there and emphasize what we have to do. You have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and if you aren't careful, you'll make it so that if a person doesn't say it just right, if they aren't baptized just right, there are some denominations that even if you're baptized and even if you're dunk, some people sprinkle, other people dunk, Man, I just hold them under until they really repent. That's the way I do it. But see, some people, it's not a matter of just being baptized. You've got to do it in the name of Jesus. If you do it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, then that doesn't work. And so there's people that split hairs over these things, and everything is about what you do, and you've got to do this, and only if you do this will God save you. And see, you can get into a ditch over there to where you are just bearing all of the burden of making everything happen. There is a freedom, a liberty that comes when you begin to understand that God by grace has anticipated everything that you will ever need and He's already provided it. Before you even get born again, God had already provided for your forgiveness of sins. Before you were born again, He's already provided for your healing. Before you ever got born again, He's already provided for your financial prosperity, your joy, your peace everything. He's already done everything, but it doesn't automatically come to pass until you respond. You know, a verse that is often misquoted is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, where it says, Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. And people will just stop right there and put a period, and they'll say, See, God is able to do anything. But that's not true. It says, According to the power that works in you. Sure, God is able. God is almighty, but He has limited Himself that He will not force His will upon any person. He has to flow through you. It's not you doing something and then God responds to you. No, God has already provided everything, but unless you yield, unless you allow by faith God to flow through you, unless you have actions that are consistent with what you're saying, 
You know, faith without works is dead is what it says in James chapter 2, verse 20. And so unless you begin to act uh, properly, then what God has provided for you by grace doesn't happen. But see, some people see this and they think, all right, so you got to do these things and then God will move. No, God's already moved and you have to do some things to allow Him to flow through you. Faith is voice activated. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. In Psalms chapter 91, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. You have to speak forth your faith. The, that the faith that is of, of God speaks on this wise out of Romans chapter 10, that you have to confess with your mouth. You confessing Jesus is your Lord doesn't make Him die for you. He's already done that. He's already provided everything, but you have to respond and speak and act in agreement with what you believe God has done for it to be able to work in your life. You know, let me turn over here and um, use uh, creation as an example of this. Over in Genesis chapter 1, and I'm not going to take time to read all of these scriptures, but if you were to study the creation it says that God created the heavens and the earth and then He said, let there be light and then He said, let the dry land appear and then He spoke and all of the trees and the plants and everything that grew out of the ground came to being and then He spoke over the waters and commanded all of those living creatures to come and then He spoke over the land and had all of the animals created and then He spoke over man and He created our bodies and breathed into us the breath of life. We were the last thing in His creation. And immediately after He created Adam and Eve, it goes on to say that in, in Genesis chapter 2, that on the seventh day He rested. He created man on the end of the sixth day. He created those animals on the sixth day and then He created man. So He created the animals first, we were towards the end of the sixth day and immediately after the creation of Adam and Eve is when God rested in Genesis chapter 2. Now the significance of this is that we were the crowning jewel of God's creation. Men are worth more than all of the plants and the animals. And again, this... Man, I don't want to get stuck here, but I just can't help but mention that our environmentalists today and, and our... Uh, people that are so afraid, you know, about the creation and they're exalting all of these things and they're, they would rather people die. Matter of fact, I've heard Bill Gates even say that the world is overpopulated and I heard him say that if they could come up with a vaccine, they could kill 10 to 15 percent of the world's population and he's doing that to save our planet. I guarantee you, people are more important than the planet. Now, I'm not a person that trashes the planet. I praise God. I live in a beautiful place and I love nature, but I guarantee you, we were the crowning jewel and God created all of these things for us to enjoy. And so we were really the focus of God's creation. And yet He created us last. Why do you think that is? You know, it's... Let me just read a little bit of this. He says in verse... Uh, 29, Genesis 1, 29, And God said to Adam and Eve, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all of the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And God saw everything that He had made and behold, it was very good and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Here's the point I'm trying to get across. God didn't wait until He had created us and then we had a need and we said, you know, Adam said, God, I'm hungry. I need something to eat. And God said, oh, well, let me create some food for you to eat. No, God anticipated that they were going to need food to eat. He's the one that created us and made our body so that we have to have food. So He created all of the trees and everything way before He even created us. So the supply was created before the need existed. And then when Adam, you know, and Eve, they needed to breathe and they said, God, I'm... I need to breathe. I need oxygen. He said, oh, well, let me create oxygen for you to breathe. No, he created all of the trees and all the oxygen and the trees would purge and convert this carbon dioxide 
back into uh, nutrients and stuff and purify the air. God anticipated everything. And see, this is the reason that I do not share the climate uh, crisis people, that the earth is fragile. God anticipated how many people there would be on this planet. Right now we have around 8 billion people. It doesn't matter if we get to 16 billion, 20 billion people or whatever. God has anticipated anything that's ever going to happen and this earth is well able to sustain it. God is not surprised. He didn't ever, you know, He never anticipated there being this many people and so the earth can't bear it. That is, you are just totally taking God out of the picture and acting like God is responding to us. God anticipated what the needs of the human race would ever be, and before we existed, He's already created the supply. Did you know I've heard that there is enough oil in the United States to run the world at the present use of uh, fossil fuels for over a hundred years out of just the deposits that are in shale oil and things like that in the United States. And yet we've got people crying foul and talking about that we're running out and stuff. And even if you don't like fossil fuels, uh, there are people that have designed cars that will run off of water, that you can separate the hydrogen and the oxygen and burn those things. And there are people that have done that. And I don't know if that's the answer, but there's something. God, you know, it's, there's no problem. God has anticipated every problem that the world will ever have. All we need is the creative ability to find those solutions and do it. But there, there isn't a fragile earth. And this whole climate stuff is just a crock. So my point is that before Adam and Eve needed to eat, God created the food. Before they needed the air to breathe, God created the air. Everything that the human race will ever need, God's already anticipated. He put in the earth everything that we would ever need. I often say it this way, that there is nothing above ground that wasn't at some time in the ground. Most people haven't thought of that. But did you know if you frame a house and build it out of wood, that wood grew out of the ground? If you build steel, did you know that steel is the minerals that were in the ground that have just been rearranged and melted and things like this and turned into steel? All of the gold, the silver, all of the, um, you know, the um, things that are involved in a cell phone, anything. This marble table came out of the ground. The wood base that it's on came out of the ground. You and I came out of the ground, our bodies, all of the animals, everything that is above ground at some time was in the ground. God has put on this earth, in this earth, everything that the world will ever need. There is nobody that is going to surprise him. There is not going to be such a population that we won't be able to meet the need. God has made it so that before the need existed, the supply was already created. Now see, that's grace. But does that mean that it's automatically going to work? No, we have to learn what's there. We had to learn about taking sand and how you can heat it and make glass out of it. And we use glass and all of these different things. But everything that was needed was already there. And does that mean it's just going to automatically happen, that, that glass windows are going to automatically happen, that buildings are going to automatically grow up? No, they don't grow like plants or trees. We have to create them, but we are using the things that God has already supplied. So grace has already provided everything that you will ever need but it's not going to automatically happen. You have to respond, but your response isn't really what's making it happen. People say, look at what men have created. Men haven't really created anything. All they've done is figure out what God already provided. It's God that made it so that water could exist in a solid form, in a liquid form, and in a gas form. God's the one that created all that, and we've learned how to use those things and stuff, but we aren't creating anything. When we create a steam engine, we didn't create that. God's the one that created it. We just cooperated with it. And see, this is the way it is. Grace has already provided everything for us, but then we have to respond. But we aren't making God do something. We are just discovering what God has already done. Philemon chapter 1, verse 6. Paul was praying for his friend Philemon, and he says, I pray that the communication of your faith would become effectual 
HOW? BY ACKNOWLEDGING EVERY GOOD THING WHICH IS IN YOU IN CHRIST JESUS. NOTICE HE DIDN'T SAY THAT YOUR FAITH BEGINS TO WORK BY LEARNING HOW TO GET ME TO DO SOMETHING FOR YOU, TO PROVIDE SOMETHING NEW. NO, GOD HAD ALREADY PROVIDED IT, BUT WE HAVE TO ACKNOWLEDGE WHAT HE'S ALREADY DONE. WE HAVE TO DISCOVER. WE HAVE TO BEGIN TO START RESPONDING AND ACTING LIKE WHAT GOD SAYS IS TRUE. SO WE DON'T MAKE GOD DO ANYTHING. WE ARE SAVED BY GRACE. THAT'S WHAT GOD HAS ALREADY DONE. BUT THEN WE HAVE TO RESPOND POSITIVELY. WE HAVE TO REACH OUT AND TAKE WHAT HE HAS PROVIDED. SO WE'RE SAVED BY GRACE THROUGH FAITH. THERE IS A PART THAT IS GOD'S PART AND THERE'S A PART THAT'S OUR PART. AND IF WE TRY AND GET GOD TO DO WHAT HE TOLD US TO DO, THAT'S NOT GOING TO WORK. OR IF WE TRY AND DO WHAT GOD SAID HE'S ALREADY DONE, THAT'S NOT GOING TO WORK. WE GOT TO HAVE A CLEAR DISTINCTION ON WHAT FAITH IS AND WHAT GRACE IS. WE'VE GOT TO LEARN OUR PART. WE'VE GOT TO LEARN HOW TO RESPOND POSITIVELY TO GOD. WE'VE GOT TO LEARN HOW TO REST IN WHAT HE'S DONE. AND THAT'S WHAT THIS WHOLE TEACHING THAT I HAVE ENTITLED LIVING IN THE BALANCE OF GRACE AND FAITH IS ALL ABOUT. AND WHEN GOD SHOWED ME THIS, IT HAS LITERALLY TRANSFORMED MY LIFE. IT HAS GIVEN ME AN ASSURANCE, A PEACE. IT'S GIVEN ME A REST. YOU KNOW, uh, I'VE HEARD STATISTICS THAT 80% OF MINISTERS BURN OUT. THEY QUIT WITHIN FIVE YEARS. AND OUT OF THE 20% THAT ARE STILL IN MINISTRY AFTER FIVE YEARS, 80% OF THOSE ARE BURNED OUT AND READY TO QUIT. THAT MEANS ONLY 4% OF MINISTERS ARE SUCCESSFUL AND uh, ENJOYING MINISTRY AFTER FIVE YEARS OF MINISTRY. AND I CAN TRUTHFULLY SAY IT'S BEEN 55 YEARS FOR ME AND THE KEY TO MY LONGEVITY AND THE KEY TO MY PEACE AND THE FACT THAT I'M NOT STRESSED OUT AND STUFF IS BECAUSE I UNDERSTAND THESE THINGS ABOUT WHAT'S GOD'S PART AND WHAT'S MY PART. AND I'VE, lear I've LEARNED TO REST IN THE LORD AND KNOW THAT GOD HAS NOTHING BUT GOOD PLANS FOR ME. AND IT'S JUST A MATTER OF ME CALMING MYSELF, re REJECTING FEAR, AND OPERATING IN FAITH. AND IF I DO THAT, THINGS WORK. I WANT TO THANK YOU FOR WATCHING OUR YOUTUBE CHANNEL AND THE PROGRAMS THAT WE HAVE AVAILABLE. AND I WANT TO ENCOURAGE YOU THAT YOU CAN GET THE MATERIALS THAT WE'VE OFFERED. ALSO, I'D LIKE TO ENCOURAGE YOU TO LIKE OUR PROGRAM AND SUBSCRIBE TO WHAT WE'RE DOING. WE HAVE A LOT OF MATERIAL, AND I BELIEVE IT'LL BE A REAL BLESSING TO YOU. SO THANK YOU FOR BEING A PART OF IT. GOD BLESS YOU.